So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Abel Shinkovic. I came from the Ötvös-Loránd University, Budapest, Hungary. And um, I'm doing a PhD on the connection between C++ template metaprogramming and functional programming. And uh, today I'm going to present you uh, an approach to make use of the functional programming code or the functional programming paradigm in, uh, in, in template metaprogramming. And since we already have the Boost MPL library, I will show you how um, the Boost MPL library can be extended with tools uh, based on the functional paradigm. And uh, I chose the Haskell as the functional language to base these new things on. So the additions to template metaprogramming and Boost MPL will be following Haskell's logic. And um, I'm building open source libraries. Yes? Question, why would you choose Haskell if you're... Okay, so the question, the question was why I chose Haskell. And uh, the reason is that there are many familiarities or similarities between the logic of template metaprogramming and the way Haskell programs are constructed and evaluated. Yes? I see. Uh, one of the reasons is the laziness. So, okay. The question was why not, uh, why, why Haskell and why not ML or Scheme or some other functional language? And um, the answer to that is uh, that uh, the lazy evaluation of Haskell. And uh, many of the features I will show um, are, are better suited or seems to be, seem to be better suited. Are there other questions? Okay. So I'm building uh, libraries for template metaprogramming, and uh, there are a few of them. And uh, I'm going to show you Metamonad. So everything I'm presenting to you today are implemented in Metamonad. And you can download it and play with it. Here is the URL. So there is the full documentation as well. <clears throat> and uh, here are the people who are working on these libraries. So it's, it's not just me. And uh, this is the agenda for today. As you can see, here is uh, quite a few features. And I will show you how can these things be provided in C++ template metaprogramming. And as you can see, it's, it's a pretty long list. So I will, not going in, I will not be going into the implementation details of these things. I will show you how you can use it and how it works and how you can build things using these, these elements of Metamonad. So let's get started. And uh, as the beginning, I will show you the, the most common uh, example for C++ template metaprogramming, how to calculate factorial at compile time using templates. And uh, here is the template metaprogramming code. And uh, here is the Haskell equivalent. I got this idea from uh, Bartosz Milewski from last year's conference. So there is the Haskell code. And uh, we want to calculate the factorial of n. And we do it by calculating n times factorial of n minus 1. And of course, uh, we need to stop this recursion with factorial 0. And as I said, this is one of the classical examples. It works. And it works fine for uh, calculating factorial or Fibonacci or some other basic arithmetic computations. Yes? So why do you need enum? I just chose enum. I could have used, okay, sorry. Uh, the question was, why enum? And the answer is, uh, I could uh, use const int or const expression int. I decided to use enum. It's, there's no real reason. Okay, so it seems like an unusual uh, representation of the No real reason. Okay, so um, this thing works, but uh, if we want to start building more complex things and uh, construct more complex algorithms and execute them at compile time using templates, we suddenly 
need a large amount of features such as control structures, algorithms, data structures, lambda expressions, and so on and so forth. And uh, these things are provided by Boost MPL. So doing all these things manually, in a similar way, we implemented the factory L would be pretty difficult, but we can just take Boost MPL and use it. And uh, here is a list of features Boost MPL provides. And if you look at it, especially for the first three elements, it uh, suggests that uh, Boost MPL is trying to provide a similar environment at compile time that uh, the standard template library provides at runtime. And um, Boost MPL is a really good library for um, programmers who, who try, try to execute algorithms at compile time but want to think in the same way they are thinking when they are building runtime C++ programs. At the same time, the similarities between template metaprogramming and the functional paradigm are known. So here are a few features that are common in C++ template metaprogramming and uh, what is or what are important uh, when you're doing functional programming. <clears throat> and here is a list of language elements functional languages provide to the developers who are developing code following the functional paradigm. And the idea is that the metamonad library provides these language elements for template metaprogramming the same way Boost MPL provides these things. So using metamonad, you can just use currying or algebraic data types or case expressions and so on. And I will show you how you can use these things. <clears throat> so let's start with a pretty simple example. What do you think this is? Well, there was a guess, foobar, but uh, yeah, other tips? Sorry? <laughs> Who was that? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. It, it depends. You cannot tell. So if you see this in the middle of a, of a C++ program, all you see that is it's, it's a template class inheriting from something else. But if you put a comment there saying, well, this is a template meta function and this is template meta function forwarding that, that helps the reader a bit. <clears throat> and uh, Metamonad provides a macro where you can say that, okay, I want to define a template meta function. It's called foo. It has two arguments, A, B, and this is the body. And it will generate something like this. And now this macro is just a, a pretty printing thing, or at least a, a syntactic sugar. Later on, it will provide uh, something more. <clears throat> Another example, and this is very important for, the, for all of the features that we have. Um, here is an expression, a template metaprogramming expression using boost MPL. It says, if true, then two, otherwise seven. What do you think the result of this will be? Sorry? Yes. So uh, it will be MPL into two. So let's make it a bit more complicated. Let's say one times if true, then two, otherwise seven. What do you think the result of this will be? Yes? Yes, so the guess was that it will not work, and this was correct. Um, one may think that the result of this is also two, but uh, in the reality, it, it produces a pretty ugly compilation error. <clears throat> I will show you right now. I haven't said that. I just said it will not work. <clears throat> so this is the problem. If you look at this expression, if true, then two, otherwise seven, then it's an instance of the uh, if template class. And when you call the times meta function with one and this inf thing, then this if thing is passed to times as it is. 
and times, so this error message is a pretty ugly way of saying that times has no idea how to multiply an int with an if because this if is not evaluated. This is kept as if and that is the problem. And uh, yeah? The question was if I'm going to make a macro that will evaluate if, and my answer is no. But I will do something else that will evaluate if. Uh, so if I access colon colon type of this thing, then it will evaluate to two, and then times will be called with one and two as arguments, and the result will be two. And uh, this thing is a, a calculation that has all the arguments that it needs, but it's not evaluated yet. It can be passed around across function calls and be evaluated at a later point in time. And in many functional languages, this thing is called a tongue. <clears throat> and what we can do is uh, write something that will evaluate if, and this something will be a helper meta function called lazy times. It takes the same arguments as, as the original times, but the idea is that this lazy times will access that colon colon type thing and then call the original times function. So the user of this lazy times, as, uh, us, the, we don't have to worry about putting colon colon type there because lazy times will take care of this. And um, meta functions that uh, access colon colon type of their arguments are called lazy template meta functions. And um, lazy times is called lazy times because it creates a lazy version of times. So it's a lazy wrapper of the times meta function. And there is a problem there. It will access colon colon type of everything, not just this tank, but also this int one. And to make this thing work, int one has to provide this. So if you access colon colon type of int one, it has to give int one back again. And then when you use it in lazy meta functions, it works fine because a colon colon type will be int one again. So it, it will not break things. And uh, meta monad calls these things template meta programming values. So a template meta programming value is something that has colon colon type and it points to the, to the same type again. And uh, the constant wrappers in boost MPL provide this. The constant wrappers in the standard library of C++11 provide this as well. So they are template metaprogramming values. And uh, Metamonad makes an assumption that every class we use uh, in template metaprograms as values are template metaprogramming values. So they have a colon colon type pointing to themselves like this. And this is important obviously because uh, we can safely call colon colon time type uh, every time on every value and we can just say colon colon type colon colon type colon colon type yes well, what about like a lazy lazy value or something like that you know what do you mean okay so the question was what about a lazy lazy value that you have to call colon colon type twice to get the value and uh, my answer is that uh, Metamonad makes another assumption that's not on the slide, that when you evaluate a meta function, you get back a template meta programming value. So you never get back a lazy value. Exactly. Okay, so all functions always return template type. Yes, so every function returns a template meta programming value and not a lazy, lazy, lazy value. Yes. <clears throat> uh, it causes a problem, actually, this assumption. What about int? What if I want to create a type list with an int in it or do some compile time calculations with, with the built-in types that are obviously not template metaprogramming values? So this, this would break. And the idea is that it's pretty easy to write a boxing class for these things such as int and then pass box int around in template metaprograms and at the end we can of course unbox it easily once we're done with the computations. <clears throat> okay, so we've seen what laziness means and uh, why it's important. 
let's look at the uh, factory implementation and let's look at how the factory R can be implemented using boost MTL. <coughs> here is the template metaprogramming code and here is a runtime C++ code this time. And the factory of n is uh, if n is 0, then 1. Otherwise, it's n times factorial of n minus 1. <coughs> and because uh, the meta functions in boost MPL are not lazy, we have to put colon colon types everywhere to make it work. And let's look at it. What happens if I try to evaluate the factorial of 0 using this? Of course, the body will be instantiated with 0. And everything that has colon colon type on it will be evaluated, which means this will be evaluated to true, this will be evaluated to minus one, and this will also be evaluated, which means that we will evaluate the factorial of minus one. And the problem is that because we had to write colon colon type everywhere, this thing was evaluated before eval if could choose between the two cases. So it's something like eval if now evaluates both cases and then chooses one of the results. And uh, because of this, the recursion never stops. So laziness is not just uh, a simple syntactic thing that we have to put colon colon type there or not. It uh, also makes the implementation of recursive meta functions difficult. Yes? I'm sorry, what I'm trying to introduce. What expression? I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting it. This. Yeah, well, what makes it eager is that both sides are evaluated before the condition could choose, if that's what you mean. Yeah. I'm, I haven't tried to make it lazy yet. Oh. I try to look at what Boost MPL provides now. Yes, and that's eager. That's eager evaluation. Lazy evaluation is adding a lazy wrapper to every meta function. That is eager evaluation. Okay. Um, so if we do the same thing with lazy meta functions, so this code is the exact same as we had before, but this time instead of using the eager meta functions directly from boost MPL, we use the lazy versions of these things everywhere. <coughs> And now, if I try to evaluate the factorial of zero, this thing gets uh, instantiated. So this, this body is instantiated. But we have only one colon colon type in it, which means that only this thing will be evaluated eagerly. And the rest of the evaluation happens in a lazy way, which means this is the definition of the lazy wrapper of evolif. And it evaluates the condition, which is true. And then it calls the eager version of evolif with the two possible options. And now evolif can say, OK, and I choose one. And that's it. And it will not evaluate the other, other case. Yes? Just getting rid of the type? 
So you're asking if I used here uh, a lambda expression. So yeah, and instead of having a ring, you get in each of those expressions, you're making them a lambda expression because you are. Is that a mastery equivalent to just removing a type and making your base zero? So the question was if I use a lambda expression with zero arguments, is the same what, as I'm doing here with laziness. And uh, my answer is that it depends on the body of the, of the lambda. So if you look at this, this code, the problem here is that I had to use colon colon type everywhere at every level. And if I replace this thing with a lambda, then the body will still need colon colon type everywhere because uh, times doesn't accept tanks. It needs them to be evaluated. And I would have the same problem because of those colon colon types. Are there other questions? OK. So uh, we've seen how important laziness is for implementing recursive template meta functions. And now comes the price of using laziness. And I demonstrate it uh, by showing you what happens if I ev uh, evaluate the Fibonacci of three in a lazy and in an eager way. In an eager way, it can be implemented using a helper meta function, which I haven't showed you, but it can be done. <clears throat> In a lazy case, Fibonacci 3 will instantiate Fibonacci 3 minus 1 and 3 minus 2. Fibonacci uh, 3 minus 1 will instantiate 3 minus 1 minus 1 and 3 minus 1 minus 2, which means that there are five instantiations of Fib. In the eager case, uh, the argument of Fibonacci has to be evaluated before we instantiate Fibonacci. So Fibonacci 3 instantiates Fibonacci 2 and Fibonacci 1. And Fibonacci 2 instantiates Fibonacci 1 and Fibonacci 0. But memoization comes into the picture, and this becomes one template instance instead of two. So in this case, in the eager case, we instantiated only four factorials, or Fibonacci's. And uh, this seems to be a small difference for Fibonacci 3. But uh, using uh, Zoltan Porkolabs and Zoltan Boroknoid's uh, template metaprogram debugger, which will, they will present on Thursday, I have generated the same diagram for the Fibonacci of 10. And as you can see, there is a huge difference in this case. <clears throat> and uh, I have created the diagram using the same tool, counting the number of instantiations using or calculating Fibonacci in a strict way and in a lazy way. And it's uh, linear, so it's uh, 500,000 of 1 million and so forth and so on. It did, it all compiled, and this was the number of template instantiations. Uh, it, it uh, uses a lot of memory. So the major problem with uh, template instantiations is that the memory consumption will be extremely high. So the question, the question was uh, that uh, did I tell the compiler to use uh, 10 gigabytes of memory? And um, when the, the memory consumption gets extremely high because of the large number of template instantiations, then it seems to, to slow down the compilation in a, in a very bad way. So when the compiler has to start uh, swapping and these sorts of things. But I, I didn't give Clang any extra options. I was using Clang because the debugger uses them. OK. Um, so uh, we need laziness, but we have to be careful with this because, because of this price. <coughs> And uh, let's start to look at the different features I have listed so far. So now we have laziness. We have seen how laziness works. And now let's start using it. And here is an expression, 11 plus 2. It's a template meta programming expression. It uses boost MPL plus. And if I 
use colon colon type on it, it will get evaluated and I get 13. Um, and the idea is that uh, why would I evaluate it? I could pass this expression as an expression around in template meta programs, and the expression itself would be the volume. And I could uh, call meta functions and pass this expression as a volume to them, and meta functions could return this expression as a volume to me. <clears throat> and uh, by expression, I mean the syntactic form of an expression. So you can think of it as, as an AST, plus 11 and 2. And I, I don't really care about what it means, how it would be evaluated. It's just an expression. And uh, if I introduce a wrapper, let's call it syntax, then uh, I can protect it from being uh, evaluated. And I can keep it as, as an expression. So if I call colon colon type on this syntax, I will get this syntax back. And I can call colon colon type on it as much as I want. So I can call meta functions and give them this syntax, which means I give you this expression 11 plus 2, and they can return this expression 11 plus 2. Yes? Yeah, so the question was that uh, is syntax exactly like box? And yes, so far it's exactly like box. But there is an extra thing to it, eval syntax. So when I say that, okay, I've been passing it around as a value, and now I want to evaluate it, then I get a, a meta function, eval syntax, which unwraps it and then evaluates it, which means that it will give me 13 back. So it says, okay, now the time has come. Let's evaluate this thing now. And then I get 13. And this is not something you would do for box. Uh, this thing becomes interesting when we introduce variables. Let's say a variable is an instance of the var template. And every variable has an identifier, which is just a type. So if I want to create a variable a, then I can declare this a type and then refer to this variable as var a. And then I've got an expression with an open variable in it. And I can create a type def to make it look better. So I can say that type def var a, a, and after that I can refer to this variable as a, which makes it more readable. And uh, of course I could do the same for b, c, d, and z. And uh, metamonad provides a header file which defines all these one letter long variable names. But if you need other variable names, you can just create your own this way. <clears throat> what happens if I try to evaluate this thing? Uh, so the, uh, the question was that I have no binding for A. And yes, I have no binding for A. Yes, that is an error. Uh, if I try to evaluate it, it will try to evaluate 11 plus A. And plus will complain that it cannot deal with, with a variable. So let's do variable binding. Or it is actually a variable substitution. So it says, take this syntax and replace every occurrence of A with this other syntax. And this is just a syntactical transformation. So this thing doesn't really care about the semantic. It just takes this expression, searches every occurrence of A, and puts this other expression there. Yes? And what if um, there's like another syntax within the syntax? Would it have to be that one too? So the question was, what if there is a, a syntax inside a syntax? And um, as they've said, uh, syntaxes are similar to boxing, so they protect their content. Um, it will stop at the inner, inner syntax. So it will not go into the inner syntax or into, in a, into a box. These things protect their content because they may be something you don't want to or you should not touch. Okay. Uh, I called it let because it is extremely similar to the let expressions of many languages, including Haskell. Uh, and when I evaluate this thing, I will get another syntax back. 
So it's just a pure syntax transformation utility. It will not evaluate it. It will give 11 plus 2 back. And uh, in Boost MPL, there is a convention that if I have a meta function taking a box for you, then there is an underscore C version of it, which takes the unboxed version of the volume. And uh, following a similar logic, Metamonad introduces the underscore C version of flat and many other utilities that operate on syntaxes. And let's see wraps this thing and this thing with syntax and calls the original let. But it makes the code look simpler. Was there a question or? Okay. <clears throat> and uh, using this makes the code look better and it's easier to read the code. If I want to evaluate the resulting syntax or yeah the resulting syntax then I have to wrap the whole thing with eval syntax. So it will do the substitution and then eval syntax will do the calculation and this will give us 13 back. And because this is often needed Metamonad provides an eval let C which does let and eval syntax together which makes the code, again, more compact. <clears throat> Another thing we can do with these syntaxes is uh, something I'm going to show you now. Here is an example of syntax, A plus B. And uh, this syntax could be the body of a lambda expression. And the arguments of that lambda are the variables A and B. And this thing defines a lambda expression so it's basically a template meta function class. And we can give it a name, such as add. And then we can use it as any other template meta function class. So we can call it with 11 and 2 as arguments. And then we get 13. <coughs> um, there is, of course, an underscore C version of this as well, which makes it easier to use. What do you think happens if I call it with one argument only? So I call it with one, and that's it. Exactly, currying. So it will be at another lambda expression, which takes the other argument only, and substitutes uh, A with one. Well, actually, the implementation of lambda does the substitution using let, and uh, the evaluation of the resulting expression using evaluation syntax. So everything be, is built on top of flat and each other. <clears throat> I can give this new lambda expression a name, such as inc, since it increments its argument by one. And uh, then I can just use it as any other lambda expression. So I can call it with 12, and then I will get 13 again. <clears throat> and uh, another thing Metamonad provides, so if I use this meta function macro, to define a meta function that adds two values. And I call this meta function with one argument, it will also do currying for me. And it will also define the same lambda expression, so I can call that thing inc as well. <clears throat> so that's another thing that this meta function macro gives us currying for, for simple meta functions. Another thing that uh, is a big problem in template metaprogramming, how do we handle and report errors? And here is an example expression, divides one, zero. So I try to divide one by zero. What will happen if I try to evaluate this? Sorry? <laughs> yes, <laughs> boom. So it will try to evaluate this expression and it will give us a compilation error. So let's create a safe version of the division, which uh, will give us some extra or special value when the division cannot be done. And uh, if there is this boom thing, then uh, there's no way to recover. So I cannot write a, a wrapper code on top of this that uh, recovers from that error situation or provides a meaningful error message or a, a nicer error message. But if I provide a save device function, which returns some uh, special value in case there is, uh, or in case the division cannot be done, then I can wrap this function call 
with some other code that uh, provides a more meaningful error message or does something else. And it can, of course, be implemented that way that I say if b is 0, then return a special value called nothing. Otherwise, do the division and wrap the result with just. So this save device will either give me nothing or just and the result back. <clears throat> and uh, these names came from Haskell, where there is a type called maybe. And the values of that type are either nothing or things wrapped by just. And this is used exactly for this, for reporting errors. So the, if the compilation went fine, I return just and the result. Otherwise, I return nothing. I mean, the volume, nothing. Yes? So the question was uh, if I considered using the boost names optional and none. And uh, I was trying to follow the Haskell naming convention. And that's why I, I used nothing and just. So that, that's why it's called nothing and just. OK. Um, in Haskell, these two things are called constructors because uh, they are used to construct values. So when I return nothing, then this is a, a value in metaprogramming. So it, it has to be a template metaprogramming value, of course. If I return just 13, for example, then that is a value again. So um, it uh, has to be a template metaprogramming value again. And there are other tricks in the implementation of these things, which uh, one should be careful with. And to make it more simple, Metamonad provides a macro where you can say that, OK, I want a maybe type with two constructors, nothing taking no arguments, and just taking one argument. And this thing will generate everything for you. And even uh, currying for constructors with multiple arguments. Yes? So even, even C++ is different? No, it's all C++ 98. I know, with variadic macros. Yes? Uh, it uses the preprocessor. Uh, so how this thing is implemented? Yeah. It uses the preprocessor library of Boost. Yes, but how does it sorry, what does that kind of template add to the equation? So that thing will generate these types with their full definition. and the definitions as well. So it generates the declarations and the definitions with all the tricks you have to be careful with. Maybe goes into the definition of nothing. And just, unfortunately, in C++ template metaprogramming, you cannot express that nothing and just uh, build up a type. They are just independent constructors. And uh, Metamonad provides a meta function you can use to query uh, this maybe thing from nothing and from just values. But that's all it is there for. So it's, it's more uh, information to the reader of the code rather than the compiler that you just give it a name. Because it makes it easier to read the code. So that's why there is that name. So, so maybe it isn't used anywhere? I mean, maybe it's just ignored in that macro. The question was, is maybe just ignored in that macro? And almost. It is almost ignored. As I said, uh, there are meta functions that you can use to query this maybe from nothing. So you can use uh, any value built using these constructors or constructors of any data type. And you can say that, OK, and give me the name of that type. And it will give maybe back. Yes? So 
Yes. So it is for the generation of these constructors and for documentation as well. Yes? And what about like a deconstructor? You know, something like that? What, what like, do you like think of? Like a lowercase maybe function in Haskell? I don't know that. So a constructor, you have these two different things and they each have their own arguments, right? Oh, yeah. A deconstructor will so, take okay. a function that will handle each of those two scenarios. So the question was what about the deconstructor and uh, there is no such thing. There is pattern matching that will come later. Are there other questions? Okay. <clears throat> when I use this just 13, then I want it to be a template metaprogramming value, which means if I put colon colon type on it, then it should give just 13 back. But uh, this just thing is more complicated than that. Because in this case, for example, I'm using it as a lazy template meta function. I call it with this tongue, lazy divides and two numbers. And when I call colon colon type on it, I want to get this just back. <coughs> I, I want to get just 13 back. Yes? Save divides is the name of this template meta function. So uh, just has to be a template meta programming value and a lazy template meta function at the same time. And uh, it works that way that when you have just T with some type T and you use colon colon type on it, it will instantiate just with T colon colon type. And uh, if there is a value inside that, then it will remain the same. So it will instantiate itself again. And when there is a tank in it, it will evaluate that tank and then give the, the result back. And this is all done for you by MPLX data. OK, we've got this uh, save device function. So let's use it somewhere. Um, here is a meta function, which is uh, more of a demonstration than a, a useful example. There is a div or first meta function taking two arguments. And it says that when you try to do a valid division, such as 6 uh, divided by 2, then it will give the result back. But uh, when you try to do an invalid division, such as 1 per 0, then it will give the first argument uh, that A back. And how can we implement it? using this save device function we just created. <clears throat> well, we can check if save divides could do the division or not. When it could not do, do the, when it could not do the division, then it returned nothing. <clears throat> and if it returned nothing, then we should give A back. And the question is, what should we give back when the division could be done? The problem there is that when I call save divides with some valid values, then I will get just three back. But I should give three back and not just three back. So I, I should unwrap it somehow. And um, the way functional languages approach it, or most functional languages approach it, is a pattern matching. So you say that here is this expression save divides. Which will, which will give me something like that back. And if it's a just n, then let's give n back. If it's a nothing, then let's give a back. And Metamonad provides a construct that uh, can be used to do this thing. So you can say that eval case, and here is the expression that you want to evaluate. And then you can say that here is a pattern. If the result matches this pattern, then give n back. If the result matches this pattern, let's give A back. <clears throat> the syntax is similar to Eric's uh, syntax, but case and match are in a reverse order. <clears throat> so was there, um, is there any kind of type checking going on here? No, no type checking. There is. I guess it could, right? It could look and see the check and nothing or both maybe. And then yeah. 
Yes, so uh, it could look at that uh, just and nothing are both maybes, uh, but it, there is no type information. Well, but the information is there, but it does not check it. So it say that you can match anything. Yes? I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> uh, are there other questions? Oh, yes? Divor first returns either A or A per B. So the question was if there could be an either type, and yes, there is an either type. It's also in Metamonad. I use uh, maybe instead because it's simpler to show. Okay. Uh, there was a question there. Okay, so the question was what that n variable is. And here is the answer. So the way pattern matching happens, well, n variable itself. How, how do I know which one is n? Okay, so n variable is constructed the way I showed it earlier, that var n underscore. And that says this is a variable. It's just a type, type depth of var n underscore. So it's, it's pretty easy to say that this is a variable because it's an instance of var. There is a type def on it to make it look better, but it's just an instance of the war template. It was my choice that it's yeah, n. So That's right. No, no, no. To it has nothing to do with the evil case. It has to do with the with the pattern, yeah. and this is why. So it's, just an it's an example, exactly. And uh, to, so a pattern is uh, just uh, an expression as well. It's a syntax. And it says it's just with the variable as its argument. And uh, pattern matching happens in a way that this value coming from safety wides is also an instance of this just template. And pattern matching says that, OK, they are instances of the same template. So let's compare the arguments. And there is a variable in the pattern. And then it says, OK, this binds the value 3 to the variable n. So using n in the pattern uh, specifies the binding of n. And then I can use this n in, in the body of that case and refer back to this value. That's the way it works. So the pattern defines what uh, the variable refers to. And then in the body, I can use the variable and the value referred to by the variable. OK. And as I said, these things are all just syntaxes. 
So there is the non underscore C version of this thing. And as you can see that there is an evil case meta function, which means that case will just choose one of these bodies, do the substitution of the variables, and give that syntax back. And you need to use eval syntax on it. Yes? Sorry? Are you limited to only two cases? The question is if it's limited to two cases and the answer is not. But uh, this, so metamonad at the moment uses only the old standard, which means that uh, these things are generated using preprocessor macros. So there is a limit on the number of cases, but it's configurable. Are there other questions? Okay. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, a simple meta function, less. It's a meta function we are writing, so it's not the less of boost MPR. We want this less to work in a way that if I try to get or compare two numbers, I can do it. <clears throat> if I want to compare two lists, I can do it, and it will do a lexicographical comparison. So I can compare lists and numbers using less. This can be implemented in a similar way. Less is implemented in Boost MPL using tag dispatching. Its implementation is not important at the moment. We just assume that it works this way. <clears throat> what happens if I try to compare things that cannot be compared, such as an int and a double? What should happen? Sorry? Yeah, so a type error. I get some sort of a type error. Well, uh, that's good, but that's, again, not recoverable. So if it's coming from uh, a library, um, then, uh, then uh, so it's coming from the, the bottom of the library, then it will show the internals of the library in the error message. I don't know what that means. Uh, return nothing, yes. I could return nothing, and that's a, a good question. But I will not return nothing. I will rather create a new data type exception, taking exactly one argument, and that one argument will describe the error itself. And then I can return exception, values cannot be compared. And of course I can create a struct called values cannot be compared. And that struct will represent the error message. So if anyone calls less with invalid arguments, he will get back an exception value. Well, it will come. So catching this will come. <clears throat> uh, we've got a comparison function that can return exceptions. So let's implement a minimum function using this. This is a minimum function calculating the minimum of A and B. <clears throat> well, this is how you would implement a minimum. If A is less than B, then return A, otherwise B. So it's a, a pretty straightforward way of writing the minimum function. <clears throat> if I try to use it to get the minimum of two numbers, it will, of course, work. If I try to get the minimum of two lists, it will work. What happens if I try to get the minimum of two boxed values? One guess is exception. Well, it will uh, give this error message. And the problem behind it is that the result of less will be an exception for you. But if we'll not be able to deal with an exception as the condition. So if we'll complain that I want a true or a false here, and I cannot, cannot do anything with an exception there. So we should do something else. We should uh, avoid giving if an exception value. If less returns an exception, we should propagate it further without calling if. And one way of doing it is using an evil case. So let's take this part, this sub-expression that may return an exception out of this and create a pattern that, uh, that is a variable itself. So it matches everything. It will match the result of less. And I can use it as the argument of if. And then if uh, less return the real value, then I can call the if code and do the processing. And I can also create another pattern 
which uh, is an exception. So if let's return an exception, let's just return that exception to the caller of min. So the question was, why couldn't if uh, deal with this exception as argument? So if anything is an exception, let's just forward it. Not anything, anything that you write. Yes. Uh, so if could do that, um, but uh, I will show you how you can prepare these things for propagating exceptions. So if cannot do it at the moment with boost MPL, and uh, we can implement exception propagation without changing if. And I will show you how. Okay, <clears throat> so now we've got this code and it does the propagation. So if I try to uh, call minimum with two values that cannot be compared, it will return that exception to me. And it does this thing, but uh, the problem here is that the exception propagation and the business logic, which is calculating the minimum of two values, are mixed together here. <clears throat> so let's try to separate these two things. Calculating the minimum and uh, propagating exceptions. <clears throat> and uh, the way it can be done is that, first of all, that we needed less here is not that important. It could be an argument. So it, it, just, uh, it is just an arbitrary expression there. And the same holds for the code that says what to do with the result if there was no exception, how to go, what, what is the continuation. So in this case, if that thing was true, then return A, otherwise return B. It, it is also just some, some code to do. So I can make it an argument as well. <clears throat> and then I get a function called bind exception, taking a value and uh, code what to do with it afterwards as arguments. And it can say that, okay, if that value was an exception, then let's just return that value. Otherwise, call that what to do with it afterwards with the value, which is guaranteed that it's not an exception. And using that, I can implement minimum. So I can say that, okay, bind exception. The first thing to check is let's say B. And if it was not an exception, then let's just use if and return A or B. And of course, I can use bind exception to do something completely different, such as summarizing three values, and I can say that, okay, let's add A and B together, and if it was not an exception, let's add C to this. So I can reuse this bind exception, and uh, these functions don't have the exception propagation logic in them. But of course, it is not that convenient to use it, so it makes it really difficult to, to read the code. <clears throat> And uh, these things were simple. So here is a more complicated example, getting the minimum of three values. And this gets this complicated using this bind exception. So it's not that useful in this form. <clears throat> uh, but what if I could do this? So implement minimum of three values in a way that I say, OK, let's use the L variable and store, the, store a boolean in it. If, less, if A is less than B. And then let's store the result of this if in M. So if A is less than B, then M will be A. Otherwise, M will be B. So basically, M will be the minimum of A and B. And then I can compare this M to C. And then I can say that, OK, and let's return M or C, depending on which one was, which one was smaller. And Yes. <clears throat> so it's, it's a sequential code, basically. And uh, you can use variables in it. And Metamonad provides this thing. It, you can use the do template, and then you can write this code and co do the computation in small pieces, but at least it in a more readable way than before. And in the background, this do template will call bind exception and combine bind exceptions together. <clears throat> Okay, let's make it a bit more simple. So the minimum of A, on a and B looks like this. And uh, this is more readable than, the, than using bind exception directly, but this is not that ideal. So this is the way we want to write the minimum calculation. 
if A is less than B, then A, otherwise B. And Metamonad provides a template called try, which takes this expression as a syntax and generates that thing out of it. And then I can use a complex expression here, combine things in a way I want, and this try template will generate that thing for me and do the exception propagation automatically. <clears throat> OK, let's make this minimum function a bit more complicated. So when I try to compare things that cannot be compared, I don't want it to return an exception. I want it to return the first argument, just to follow the earlier logic. <clears throat> and uh, well, the name try suggests that there will be a catch as well. I can say that, OK, if this thing threw an exception, and this exception was that values cannot be compared, then return A. So you can catch these exceptions as well. And of course, you can have multiple catch cases. So you can say that if there was any other exception, then let's just return B. And of course, you can have multiple catch cases, and they are checked in order. And this thing is just a syntax. Uh, it's a predicate uh, uh, deciding if you want to catch the exception. And this is the body, which is also a syntax. So you can see the underscore C's everywhere. <clears throat> OK, so we could do cool things. Let's look at that how we could generalize this thing. We had this bind exception uh, meta function. And we built a do thing on top of that that uh, provided a better syntax for using this bind exception. And uh, we put a try template on top of that that provided an even better syntax for this thing. And what if I would use a bind for some other type? So what if I would have a bind maybe, which does something similar for nothing and just things? And I could build a do template on top of that. And I could have a bind list doing some magic with lists. And I could put a do type of thing on top of that. <clears throat> and uh, how can I do that in a way that it makes sense? Here is the original version of minimum function using bind exception directly. <clears throat> and uh, if I look at this bind exception, what it does is that it takes something that's an, either an exception or a value. And then it takes a function telling us what to do with that value if it's not an exception. And it gives us an, another exception or, or a value back. <clears throat> and that function took a value. So that function could assume that this thing was not an exception. And then it could produce either an exception or a value. <clears throat> and I could generalize this idea. I can say that, OK, bind functions should work in a way that this thing is some set of values. In this case, it's either an exception or a value. And then there is a function taking a value and providing an element of this thing. And then bind could provide a, an element of that thing at the end as well. This set of values is really just a set of values in template metaprogramming. In Haskell, it is defined by the type system. But we know that there is no type system in template metaprogramming at the moment. So um, one bind operation is this exception or value thing. But here is an, another example. We could say that, OK, this set of values could be values of that maybe type we had earlier. So this can be either a nothing or a just value. And I could define a bind operation for that as well. And uh, it can be defined that way, that if it was nothing, then don't call the function. If it was just something, then call the function with that something. <clears throat> now, this set of values was easy to use in this case, because here, everything belongs to that set of values. So everything is either an exception or a value. But uh, in this case, uh, elements of this set uh, have to be either nothing or just things. And uh, I need a function that takes an arbitrary value and produces an element of this set out of that. And after that, I can easily use this bind operation. And uh, in the uh, maybe case, 
it can just wrap the argument with just. In the exception case, it can just return the value unchanged because it's already an exception or a value. <clears throat> and uh, by using the combination of this bind and return thing, uh, the do uh, template I showed you earlier can be used to combine different steps together, either using this bind exception or this bind maybe. And uh, it can provide a better syntax for, for writing complex use of this bind operation. And if I use this bind operation, then I don't have to unwrap every just thing here, and I don't have to check for exceptions here. So this, these small functions can implement the business logic, and the bind exception or bind maybe will implement the, the error propagation logic. <clears throat> what about lists? What if I wanted to define a bind and a return for lists? How could this work? Well, the set of values are the list values or the lists. I can define this return operation in a way that if you give it a value, it will be the one element list out of it. And I can define a bind operation that takes a list and some function and produce another list. And that function takes a value and produces a list out of it. And to understand the way bind works, let's look at a simple example. Here is a simple example f function. If I call f with one as argument, it will produce this two element list. If I call it with two as argument, it will produce that one element list. If I call it with three as an argument, it will produce that other one element list. So for every argument, it will produce some list. <clears throat> And I can build a list of these values. And I can call bind and say that, OK, this is the original list. And use this f function we have just defined as the operation. And what this bind operation can do is that it can call f for every argument or every element of the list, and then produce a list of lists. And it can, after that, just join these lists and produce the final result, which has to be a list. So this way, we have managed to create some sort of a bind operation that satisfies all the rules uh, I have just shown. But the question is, why did we do it? So OK, we're good. We made it. We've got a bind operation for the lists. But uh, what can it give us? <clears throat> and one thing it can give us, and I will show you, is list comprehension. So um, in many functional languages, uh, there is an option called list comprehension, or there is a, a possibility called list comprehension, which we can use to uh, implement list operations, or operations on one or multiple lists, in a really compact and easy to read way. And uh, using this do thing I have shown you, and it comes from Haskell, of course, uh, and this uh, bind operation and return operation for lists I have shown you, uh, this list comprehension can be implemented. Which means that uh, since we have that do template in template metaprogramming, and we have the bind operation for lists, we get this list comprehension in template metaprogramming out of the box. And I will show you how it works. Yes? Yes. This is the example. So the example I will use to show how it works is uh, solving this problem, which is give me all relative primes from 1 to 100. And uh, here is Haskell code using list comprehension. And here is C++ template metaprogramming code using this bind list and do operations. And the result of this thing will be, of course, a list and a list of uh, pairs number of pairs that are relative primes. So in Haskell, I say, OK, i and j pairs are the results. And I say the same in template metaprogramming. Return i, j pairs. And I say that, OK, i ranges over the 1 to 100 list. And I can use it this way in template metaprogramming. And I can say that, OK, j is the same. It ranges over 1 to 100. 
And I can say that, OK, but I want to keep only the relative primes. So I want to keep only those pairs where i and j i rel are relative primes. And of course, I assume that the function deciding if two numbers are relative primes is available. And if it is available, then that's it. I have implemented the code uh, getting all the relative primes from 1 to 100. And another way of thinking of this is this pseudo code. So it works as if I wrote this. A loop goes from 1 to 100. There is a nested loop going from 1 to 100 again. And if these things are relative primes, then keep that pair. And that's it. This is how it works. Yes? Uh, guard is a function that either returns a one element list or uh, an empty list. And this is because it works in a way that when you say set i uh, and you provide a list here, then it will take the remaining of these two blocks and uh, evaluate it for every i in that list. So every i from 1 to 100. And the same happens here. And if I don't leave it there, then this return will be evaluated to every uh, ij pair between 1 to 100, following this, this logic. But if I have this thing here, then uh, if the expression is true, then guard returns a one element list. And this thing will be evaluated once because of that one element. It can be anything. But if this thing returns an empty list, then this thing will be not evaluated because it will be evaluated zero times. That's how it implements this condition. Yes? OK. So the question was why returns a list and not just a Boolean or maybe. And the answer is that. Uh, uh, everything here has to return a list because this is a do block on lists. Because if there was a, a, a Boolean or a maybe or something, then uh, the bind operation for lists uh, couldn't, couldn't work because it expects, expects a list. And uh, a do block for lists uses that bind operation for lists. It's exactly, yeah, it's, it's, it is uh, the do notation of Haskell in template metaprogramming. Uh, are there other questions? <clears throat> uh, I've shown you a uh, bind operation for maybe exceptions and lists, but here is a list of other things where it also makes sense to implement a bind operation. As you can see, either is there. And uh, Metamonad provides bind operations for all these things, and you can use these as well. And if you look at the documentation, there are the details what you can do with these things. So there is a documentation of the entire library and the tutorial as well. So as a summary, here is a list of features I've shown you that uh, are inspired by the Haskell language and uh, makes template metaprogramming easier, yes? This? So the question is why there is no continuation. My answer is that I couldn't find a use case for it in template metaprogramming. Yes? Uh, so the question was uh, what was the use case for the exception? And uh, it was about combining meta functions and uh, doing error checking. So if you really want to do error checking, because you want to avoid the errors coming from the bottom of your library, for example, if you build a DSL parser using MetaParse I presented last year, and you've got a really complex template meta programming code, and uh, at the bottom of it, there is a, an error in the, in the DSL snippet. And you want to present it to the user, you, you don't want uh, a deep, deep template meta programming stack. You want to propagate that out and, and provide a meaningful error message. Okay, so, so it's really, it's, it's, the user's protecting, programming error is not important to me, it's on the user. It's not on the user's, I, I think that, I think that the example that you gave of the bin That's not an error on the public key 
Yes. Well, couldn't the user like summarize an argument with the medical one? Or is there a specific thing you guys think that would? And that can be checked before calling less, or it can be just given less and check the results. So there are, there are multiple ways. Of course, if you have this less and this mean, you can just give it to mean and report any error if there are problems. But I, I did not want to build an entire DSL parser to, to do a presentation. Are there other questions? Okay. So um, finally, I'd like to show you how FACT can be implemented using Boost MPL as it is now. As you can see, there is a helper uh, meta function that had to be used due to the lack of laziness. But uh, if you use things I have presented so far, you can implement FACT this way, which is much more compact. And um, here is where you find the documentation of the library. You can find the source code on GitHub. So if you want to take advantage of any of these features, you can just go there and try it out. There is also a detailed tutorial on this website with uh, all the features that the library provides. Yes? Okay, so uh, the meta part comes from template meta programming. The monad thing uh, comes from uh, the monads of Haskell. So the question was, um, why meta monad? And uh, the, the monad comes from uh, the monads of Haskell. That's one use case of it. I have presented how it provides monads, but I intentionally did not call it monad just to avoid uh, making people scared. I'm sorry? I knew the first part of it, and uh, that inspired me of not calling these things monads. I didn't know this warm fuzzy thing. This. Are there other questions? Yes? Does it depend on Boost MPL? Or can it be used on its own? The question was if it depends on Boost MPL, and the answer is yes. It uses Boost MPL in the background. Are there other questions? In that case, thank you for your attention. <laughs>